everybody, my name is Dan Skip Allen, and this is the 52 must-see movies and why they matter. And this week we are talking about another western. And um, like, like I said before, we have we're gone off the book, uh, the book, the 52 must-see movies by Robert Osborne and uh, the Essentials. They num they uh, wrote wrote this book, and it was 52 movies. And um, myself and a few friends decided you know there was more than just 52 essential movies that we um should talk about and so we all nominated a bunch of movies and this is a movie that i nominated uh but i got enlisted a help of one of my old buddies here who who did all the episodes of season one with me mr andrew cabral welcome back andrew i'm glad to be back dan um i'm glad to pitch in here and and talk about how, but that's just the way time is time is very funny yeah, we uh, we finished, we wrapped up in um, March, maybe early May, April, and so now we're in uh, August. So uh, we're going to do High New, just like Andrew said, um, starring Gary Cooper as um, the sheriff of this town, Kane. And he um, is married to Grace Kelly, and her name is Amy. And we also have uh, Lloyd Bridges in this time um, in this film. This is one of Lloyd Bridges' first movie he's ever uh, acted in. Um, also, the villain is Frank Miller, not the comic book artist, but the villain is named Frank Miller, and he's played by Ian McDonald. And also, um, we have a Ramirez um, and her, her. What's what's her first name? Something Ramirez. The bar. Uh, they uh, Helen Ramirez. Helen Ramirez, and she's played by Katie Gerardo. And uh, this is a big, big step for a Latin, Latino woman to actually have a role in a movie in 1952. Usually they would have blackface or somebody portraying uh, Latinos, which, you know, we, we see Eli Wallach doing a lot of that in, in Westerns back in the day. But um, also this film is directed by Fred Zinneman, and it has a amazing, incredible score by Dimitri Tomakin. So, talk about some of those uh, folks, those actors, you know, the director or the uh, composer, uh, Andrew. What are your thoughts on them? Yeah, well, the headliner of the movie and why it's so remembered is because it is starring Gary Cooper, who is one of the more famous and well known American actors, probably of all time. Uh, he had a great career. Uh, his the, the height of his career was probably the 30s and the 40s. And it was interesting, as I was reading, doing some homework about this, is that his career was taking a bit of a slide in the late 40s and early 50s. And this movie was kind of a revival for him. You know, he was getting older um, and he was uh, his films weren't doing as well at the box office as as they previously were. And this movie kind of kick-started his career. He would pass away, I believe, about nine or ten years after this movie came out uh, at, a very, at a rather young age of about 61. So Gary Cooper always had that, that older gentleman look to him, similar to Humphrey Bogart. And he had uh, done some fantastic films in his career. Like I said, earlier on specifically, he did movies like uh, Sergeant York and Mr. Deeds Comes to Town. Uh, things like that. He actually uh, won an Oscar, I believe, for this film, as well as for Sergeant York. So this is where he got his two Oscars. Um, when it comes to the other actors in the movie, Lloyd Bridges is a name I think many people should be familiar with. He's the father of both uh, Bo Bridges and Jeff Bridges, uh, kind of a, a uh, you know, a, a an acting lineage in Hollywood, if you will. Uh, Grace Kelly, people know probably more for her role as one of the Hitchcock Blondes, which would happen later on in this decade. This is a very early film for her. She's only about 21 years old in this movie, so really getting you know, seeing her at the very start of her career. Yeah, absolutely. Grace Kelly, you know, Rear Window, she was fantastic in that. Um, and so what um, High Noon is based off of a short story called The Tin Star from John W. Cunningham. And, you know, a lot of movies back then, they were take they they took from like all kinds of different places books and magazine articles and just they you know they didn't have as much 
material as they do now to turn things into movies like comic books and so forth and all the different um, stuff. So the Tin Star was a, a short story in a magazine that they turned into a uh, movie, and and that's why we get high nude. So um, to start it off, we get a man on a horse and um, men watching him ride. Um, then we get, like I said, we have Dimitri Tomakin, and we get this ballad of High Noon, this song that that that's it plays over the film periodically throughout the film, and it's just such a um, like m melodic song. You just know what this film is when when you hear this song. You know, it's such a big part of the film, and sometimes music can do that with. Uh, with uh, films, Andrew, and um, we get a wedding, and it turns out our stars of Gary Cooper and Grace Kelly, Kane and Amy, are getting married. And um, we get bells ringing, and men ride into town. So talk about some of that stuff. That's the beginning yeah, of it. Yeah. Yeah, the begin very beginning of this movie, they don't. They, they, this movie is very stripped down when it comes to um, kind of plot elements. It's also we should mention a very short movie. The movie's only about an hour and twenty five minutes, so it's very lean. It's very quick, and you know things get to the point very quickly. Um, like Dan said at the beginning of this movie, uh, there are these kind of outlaws or marauders, and they they're riding into town because uh, we come to find out that they want. They are waiting for the train to come at noon. And on this train is the character that Dan mentioned, who is a pretty bad outlaw himself and has a history with the Gary Cooper character. And and during right after the wedding is when we kind of find out that this character is returning to town. And, and that's when um, Gary Cooper and Grace Kelly's character uh, happen to make a decision that they're leaving the town anyway, they might as well leave now uh, because they have a pretty damn good reason to. Um, and and what we what we also find out is that is that uh, Gary Cooper's character is no longer the marshal of this town. He's leaving. He's going to he's getting married. He's going to another town to open up a store, and he's going to live his life someplace else. But now he is at a crossroads of you know should he stay here or should he leave. And initially, he does leave. Um, the, the scene that Dan talks about kind of ends with it, uh, them two riding out of getting riding out of town, and the Lloyd Bridges character is in the local, I would say, hotel, if you will, and he's looking out the window and he's seeing them ride away. Yeah, and um, they have gentlemen; these men that are riding into town, they're part of Frank Miller's. Ian McDonald's posse and they're uh, Mr. Pierce and Mr. Colby and they are part of the group that's going to come and take over the town again. But like you said, um, they end up having to drag um, Kane back into town, Marshall Kane back into town because they find out that he is, he is coming back on the noon train. Um, Ian McDonald's character of Frank Miller is coming back on the noon train. Well, that's why we get the title of the movie, High Noon. Right. And that's what they called and, it at the time, High Noon. And and in the scene that after they ride out to town is when we re is when we meet uh, the Lloyd Bridges character for the first time, and when we meet uh, the Ramirez character for the first time, and they have a bit of a a romance going on, a, a relationship going on. Um, that they kind of want to keep secret, um, that that's hinted at through, throughout the movie, um, and like Dan said, uh, the the bad guys ride out to the train depot, and the train depot guy is actually the one who rides into town to tell everybody what's happening. You know what I mean? It's not like today when you know news travels so fast and it's so easily easily accessible. It's usually just, uh, you know, back then it's usually just one guy knowing the news and then telling it to someone, they tell it to somebody else. Um, and and what ends up happening, the long and short of it is, is that the Gary Cooper character decides, you know what, I'm turning around, I'm coming back to town, and he wants to gather up a posse 
to confront Frank Miller when he arrives at noon. And he talks to the judge, and the judge is like, no, nah, sorry. It's all you, buddy. I'm thinking <laughs> off. I'm leaving town. Yeah, yeah, I'm the one who sentenced him. Who do you think he's going to kill first? Probably me. And, of course, he says, you know, one of the lines, a line in the film, he says, he swears he'll kill you. He'll never hang. You know, that's that's what uh, Frank Miller said, that he, he swears he's going to come back and kill Marshall Kane and that he's never going to hang. And, well, we find out he didn't hang, and he's coming back to kill Marshall Kane. Yeah, it, what is interesting is we find out that Frank Miller was, you know, he's a really bad guy. The town uh, was, you know, a really, you know, a, a difficult town to live in with Frank Miller and his gang running around. And Marshall Kane kind of cleaned it up, including getting Miller put in jail for murder. Um, and what happened is, you know, he got sentenced to prison. He was supposed to hang, like Dan said, and apparently he ended up getting released <laughs> instead. Yeah. And of course, there's some people in the town that don't like Marshall Kane for various right. reasons. And one of them is the hotel Mater D. And he he believes that Marshall Kane has that comeuppance coming. Uh, yeah. Comeuppance. Yes. A comeuppance. And what is interesting is the film is basically, like we said, is him going around to each place to try to get people to join him. And everywhere he turns, everywhere he goes, people say no. He goes, he goes to uh, the local saloon where Frank Miller apparently has has friends. Nobody will help him there. He goes to the church where the churchgoers are. Nobody will help him there. He go and he just goes around to even his own friends, people who he trusts. He only gets one guy to commit. He gets he does get one guy to commit. And and then and then he got the guy's like okay I'm gonna go uh, handle some stuff I'll be back later and and then he goes around and he can't find anybody to to commit to this and we find out that even though he cleaned up this town and people are safe in this town presumably people don't like him uh, and and it's interesting they're, they're they never really reveal quite why like there's never a definitive reason um, what Dan was saying with the the hotel manager is he basically. Um, blames Kane for the lack of business coming into this town, or the lack of, uh, you know, you know, economic prosperity within the town because he cleaned up all of the riffraff who I guess were, you know, populating the town uh, at the time. Hattiesville, New Mexico, is the name of the town, and like you said about the bar, but he walks into the bar, Andrew, and the bartender's the bag mouth. I'll bet such and such. Kane doesn't last five minutes. Bam! Walks right over, punches the bartender right in the face. And yeah, not the best, not the best thing to do if you're trying to convince some guys to to be on your side is to knock out the dude they're all listening to. No, no. And the bartender is um, Sam Fuller. Uh, he's basically a coward. You know, you know that's what oh, cowards. Oh, talk, the whole but, town is, the whole the whole town's full of cowards. Yeah. But what is interesting is that is that they rationalize their cowardness. Like they they make up excuses, they make up reasons why they shouldn't um, they shouldn't join the posse, they shouldn't uh, confront Frank Miller when he gets to town. Um, when he goes to the church and, and the guy gets up and, and you think initially that he's going, that he's rallying people to get on his side because a bunch of guys get up and it's like, yeah, we're gonna, this is, you know, we're gonna join you, you know, whatever, we're, go we're going in. And then one guy gets up and is like, oh, wait a minute now, let's let's think about this. You know, this guy, you know, he's a great marshal, he cleaned up this town, he's done some great things for this town, but, but you know, uh, what's, what's gonna happen when Frank Miller comes to town, there's this big shootout and people are dying in the streets, um, what are people in the North going to think about this when they hear this news? They're going to think this place is ungovernable and we're not going to be able to create any type of civilization or a town here because we have to remember that New Mexico at the time wasn't a state yet. It was just the New Mexico territory. It, had, it doesn't have statehood or anything like that. So in a sense, it very much is the Wild West. And um, I want to go back to uh, Harvey. Harvey, he was shacked up with um, Ramirez. Um, what's her first name again? Helen. Helen. Helen Ramirez. And she was a saloon owner. It's It says on the thing, Ramirez Saloon. But she realizes 
what can happen if Frank Miller takes over again. So she starts packing up her stuff and she's like, if, Harvey, if you want anything to do with it, feel free. I don't care. I'm leaving town. And then after that, Marshall Kane goes back and, and, and tells her, Hey, I just want to let you know that Miller, Frank Miller's coming to town. She's like, yeah, I already know. And uh, he's like, Oh, I figured, you know, and of course, Amy was downstairs of the hotel because she's waiting on the train, and she, and she starts asking questions. Well, who's Helen Ramirez and this and that? And the maid or D of the hotel starts telling her, and eventually she goes up and starts talking to Helen Ramirez, and she asks, "Why is he doing what he is doing?" And Helen says, "If you don't know, I can't explain it to you." Yeah, that's a that is a big line of dialogue that really resonates in this. Yeah, it's very interesting. We don't know much about the relationship between Amy and the Mar and Marshall Kane. We know that they have obviously know each other well enough to get married, but there seems to be a disconnect to uh, how long she's known him, how well she knows him, and that the Ramirez character seems to know him a lot more. She seems, because what we learn also from, I believe, that hotel manager is that Ramirez had a relationship with uh, the Miller character as well as Marshall Kane as well. They never really come out right away and say if it's romantically based. We can kind of assume that. But it, it's it, there's a lot of that kind of interconnectivity with these characters that they only allude to. They never really explore. Um, and the Ramirez character, like you said, is getting out of town because she doesn't want to... She doesn't want the Frank to deal with the Frank Miller character at all. And we have to also say that uh, Harvey, the Lloyd Bridges character, seems to be extremely jealous uh, and possessive of the Ramirez character. And the Ramirez character is a strong character. She is someone who's not going to be pushed around, not going to be, um, you know, uh, strong-armed in any way. There is that one confrontation between the two. Um, where they're sitting, where this is after Harvey has quit. Uh, one thing we didn't touch on is Harvey was the deputy and he straight up quit because he wants to be the next marshal. And he believes that Kane didn't put in a, a word for him to be the next marshal, wasn't backing him. So he tried to strong arm Kane and say, hey, I'll, I'll back you here, but, you know, I'll be the next marshal once this is over. When the new guy gets here tomorrow, you can tell him the job's already been filled. And he's he's quit as well. So in a way, he's a coward, too, just like a lot of the men in this town. Yeah, and that leads to him going into the bar, watching everything that happens into the bar, and drinking a whole bottle. And this gives him enough courage to go after Marshall Kane. And they get in a fight in the stables, they do, because of what you just talked about. They they have a knockout, dragout fight in the stables, Harvey yeah. and... Um, yeah. And the one thing I didn't mention is that he has a confrontation with Ramirez that, that where she pretty much, you know, puts him down, you know, questions his 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 manhood, if you will. Yeah. And that that also leads him to go to the saloon and get drunk and then, you know, get in a fight with with Marshall Kane and then Kane ends up beating him, beating him, beating him in that fight. That's right. And this is where we got a couple of things going on at the same time. We get um we hear a train horn, we get Marshall Kane writing a letter to his wife if he dies, and we get really ominous music playing over all of this. This that once again the score really is just really powerful in this film with the the ballad of high noon and then this ominous dark music that's playing over some of the ending scenes. Yeah, if it's it's uh, Fred Zinnemann is a director I think is very underrated. Um, he's a director who um, has actually, I believe, won four Oscars in his career, which, uh, and I believe two or three of them were for Best Director. He won Best Director for uh, A Man for All Seasons, and he won Best Director um, for uh, From Here to Eternity, which was also a Best Picture. From Here to Eternity is an amazing movie, but he also won... Um, for Best Documentary back in the 50s. And he also won, uh, I believe, for another Best Picture winner as well. 
yeah, a man for all seasons. He was a producer, so he's he had a lot. Of, he has a lot of pedigree, and he has a lot of skill as a director, as you can see in this movie. Because this movie, like we said, is really short, so there's not a lot going on. But Fred Zinnemann is able to capture the West in a different way. This film is all set in just one location in one town, probably on a backlot set somewhere on a set somewhere. But he's able to make it feel like it's this wild, wild West town. Um, there's a famous quote, I don't know who it's attributed to, but basically what they say about this movie is that um, uh, this is a Western for people who don't like Westerns because it's a Western that is so different than the Westerns at the time. Um, it's like, like Dan was saying, um, there's the music is in there, the setting is in there, the placement's in there. There's great theme work going on in this movie. And the only thing in this movie that really feels like a classic Western of its time is the climax of the movie, which is, you know, the final confrontation between the Marshal and Frank Miller when he finally arrives at the town. What is interesting that this Frank Miller character is, once we even see him, he's kind of a regular person. Like this whole time we hear about how bad he is, you know, he's this big bad guy, he's going to come back, he's going to kill you, he's going to kill Marshal Kane, and, and, you know, in a couple of minutes, you know, that's it, we should just let him run the town or whatever. Um, and once we, and the first time we see him, we actually, I believe the first shot of him getting off the train is all from, from behind his head. We don't even see the front of him. And then, and then even in the final fight, he's kind of no big, no big deal. You know what I mean? It's just in our minds through the whole movie where he's built up, he's built up as this bigger than life thing. And, and, and the final fight I think is really, really good. You know, it's, it's Gary Cooper all on his own against the whole gang of guys. And if you notice, one of the gang is Lee Van Cleef, who, of course, was in the Spaghetti Westerns later on in his career. But this is actually, I believe, his first movie. He doesn't have any lines in this movie, but this is his first movie. Yeah, let's um, let's not get ahead of ourselves, Andrew. Well, uh, well, I mean, we were talking about the third act, so I thought I would, I would, I would allude to the third act as you know its connection to the Western genre. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I completely understand where you're coming from there. But uh, so this is where we get to the third act, like you said. <laughs> we get Helen and Amy. They get on the train. And guess who's getting off the train? It's Frank Miller. He's getting off the train. And Frank's, Frank arrives and his men greet him, of course, you know. And uh, the men walk into town. One guy breaks a window and he grabs – what is it? A bonnet or something? He's. What is yeah, it? I thought it was like a like a, a purse or something, a bag, a satchel, something. Yeah. And some, I'm like, uh, like, why are you doing this now and not after the fight? But whatever. And then uh, when they come into town, we'll see. This is what this is what's amazing about this, is when they break the window, Will hears them. Will Will Kane hears them, so he's he's able to go hide, and while they're walking. He's able to shoot one of the guys. So he knocks out one of the guys right away because they were stupid enough to break the window and alert Will Kane of their presence. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, these guys aren't, aren't, aren't smart people at all. But uh, the scene, right before they arrive into town, there's this one shot I have to point out where it's him standing in the main street and it's completely empty. There is nobody around. And the camera just uh, pans back out just to see – how alone he is and how isolated he is, which I'll, I'll talk about the, the isolation in this movie a little later because it's 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 for obvious reasons and there's a point to it. But there's a great shot um, because, like we said, it's him against the world essentially. No, you're absolutely right about that. And uh, then when Amy hears the gun go off and she she assumes somebody's been shot, she jumps off the train and runs back into town, and she hides somewhere and. I don't know how this happened, but she ended up getting a gun, and she sees a guy who's who's going after uh, Will Kane, and she shoots this guy in the back. Yeah, which and, is very interesting because she's a pacifist. We learn in the movie that she is a Quaker, but not by birth, but by um, personal choice because both her father and her brother were killed by guns and violence. So she doesn't want anything to do with it. She really doesn't want anything to do with uh, the marshal taking on these guys at all, which is why she wants to get on a train and get out of there. That's right. And so now we're down to two guys 
and Will they they kind of corner Will in a in a barn, and um, Frank Miller throws a lantern into the barn, which sets the barn on fire and sets the hay on fire, and just like a good guy that he is, Will Kane decides, you know what? I'm not going to let these good horses go to waste. I'm going to I'm going to let these horses go. I'm and I'm going to hide. On one of the horses, while they're running out, I'm going to run out with one of them on their back. So he had a plan with releasing the horses because he was able to get out of there because they had him trapped. But he was able to shoot one of the guys before they were able to get him. Yeah, so now- I think he, he's running away. And then I think one of the guys shoots and he gets and he falls off the horse. But I think he turns and then he shoots the guy who's shooting him. But then he goes and he hides uh, because it's just down to him and Frank Miller. Um, and Frank finds out where he was like, why did our guy, why did one of my guys get shot right there? Frank, what's yeah. his face is over there. So he goes around the building and he goes inside. He finds out that it's Amy and he captures Amy. Yes. And then he comes out on the street and he says, Will Kane, come out. I got your woman. And he's like, all right, I'll come out. You release, if you l- release her, I'll come out. So he starts coming out, but she, like a feisty lady that she is, she ain't going down or anything. She scratches him in the face, which then releases her from him, and he gets away, and Will's able to shoot him right in the middle of the street. Right. And then, and then he, of course, he goes over to see if baby's okay, and and then and then and, and again, she's and she's okay. Um, what is interesting where she was hiding was his marshal's office. And and what do you, and that's where all the guns are, obviously. Well, that's where um, and what is interesting. Where and I, gun was. He hung yeah, it. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure because I'm pretty sure that's the gun she used. Like I'm like 100 percent on that because early on when Harvey quit, he takes off his gun belt and he hangs it on a on a peg. And there's a shot of that gun like later on that they linger on for a little bit earlier on in the movie. And like, oh, I wonder if that's gonna come back and play and play a part in this and let and and it does. And that's when, of course, he grabs her. But the more, one of my favorite parts um, is after this is over, after he shoots Frank Miller, he's dead. He has his wife. That's when all the town folk come out. They just come out of the woodwork like, oh, it's over. Oh, how'd it go? <laughs> you know? uh, yeah, and then you get, and then the dead of you, the, 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 the scene, then the, what he does at the very end. Well, the, the wagon, the boy brings out the wagon. With the horses, because that's what he had the boy. One of the things he had the boy do, because the boy wanted to fight with him. He said, "No, go back." Yeah. So the boy brings out the wagon with the horses. He hugs Amy. He gets on before he gets on the wagon with Amy. He throws the star into the dirt. They get on the they get on the wagon with the horses, and then they ride off. And that's yep. and, and then yeah, there's the shot of just I think there's a shot of the the badge in the dirt, like right down in the dirt. Um, yep. Which is a very powerful moment. It, it's it's very small, but it's very symbolic, of of you know, you know, almost like it, it it like almost purging himself of the responsibilities of being a marshal. I think also saying a statement that you know, almost like the whole time he doesn't say what he really wants to say to these people, and in that moment, I think that. That's that symbolizes what he wanted to say. You know what I mean? Is that here, take it. I'm done. You know, you ungrateful people. Here you go. You know, I'm out. Yeah, and you know, like you said, I mean, I want to, I want to go back to the shot of him in the street. All, but, but they, they're building to that scene throughout the entire movie when he's going to the different people, and and one of the the real key one to me was when. Uh, he was at the wedding and everything was fine. And he was one of his best buddies and stuff. Lon Chaney, he goes to his house and he's like, hey, I need you. You know, you one of my best friends in the whole world. He's like, Frank, I got messed up hands. I got messed up yeah. knuckles. I got I got um, arthritis. I can't, I can't do any good. F- I can't do any good for you. I'm sorry. Yeah, that- he, goes to, he goes to see Lon Chaney Jr., who I guess was the marshal before he was the marshal. Apparently. And... And it's like he's pretty much at the la- at the end of any viable canvas because even before that he goes to see uh, somebody who we we are told is his best friend, what and the, best friend? the guy the guy is such a coward 
he won't even tell him to his face that he doesn't want to do it. He has his wife do it. And he know, and he and and she's like, he's gonna know I'm lying, you know. I'm not, and then of course he knows she's lying because she says, oh, uh, oh, uh, we went, uh, you know, he went to church or whatever, and then and, and it's like, and it's like, oh, without you, and she's like, oh yeah, I'm I'm just getting dressed, I'm on my way there now or something like that, and he's like, no, he's hiding, he knows he's hiding in the back of the house. It's Sam Fuller, another great actor that you might know of, um, Harry Morgan. Harry Morgan. Now, um, Harry Morgan is a famous actor. He he did some TV um, in in the um, in the eighties, but this is one of his uh, big big roles that he um, he was in early on in his career. Um, what what was it? Um, the 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 uh, the policeman. Um, they re they did a remake. Hank, Tom Hanks and Dan Aykroyd. Did oh, a uh, drug. Say that again, Dragnet. Oh, Dragnet. That's right. yeah, Dragnet. Harry Morgan yeah, yeah. is from Dragnet. Well, he was also he was also famously in Mash. Mash too. Oh, that's right, yeah. Mash. I forgot about that Mash. That's right. Those are the two things. So Harry Morgan is the friend, and um, he, like you said, he he asked his wife to go out there and uh, and do it for him. And he, so nobody wants to stand with Will no. Kane, and, and even the guy. Even the guy who said he would stand with him, uh, who comes back later, who I talked about earlier, uh, yeah, he backs out as well. He's like, and when he comes back, he's like, okay, how many? You're like, uh, all right, where are the fellows going to be? We've got to stop planning. And and uh, Marshall King goes, we the, couldn't get anybody. And the guy's like, I got a family. I, I don't want to die. Here you go. I, you know, but if you can get guys, I'll be back. Yeah. So that, that, that isolation scene, it, it really plays – a major role in the film because it's it's in on the marketing as well it's like you know my my dvd copy what's he's on the cover by himself you know standing in the middle of the street you know and so it just tells you that what kind of a man would go up against these four men with the reputation of frank miller and what he did prior to um the five years you know, the town's been prosperous and everybody's happy. And this comes up a couple times. Five years he's been the marshal and everything's fine. No problems. Women can walk down the street. now. But when, when Frank Marshall was around, yeah, was the hotel prosperous and the saloon busy? Sure. But were people safe? No. And that's why it's such an iconic scene of Gary Cooper standing in the middle of the street. What more do you have to add on that, Andrew? Well, what I was alluding to earlier about the, the overall isolation uh, theme that's throughout this movie is that this movie is an allegory to what was going on in Hollywood and in the country at the time with um, uh, uh, with the House and Americans Committee, uh, with the, uh, the blacklisting in Hollywood and all that stuff. And this movie is basically an allegory that is saying about how the Hollywood community, you know, wouldn't support the people that were being called out, how they turned their backs on them, how there was, how there were people who were betraying their friends and things like that, and how just the overall division within Hollywood uh, was that existed at the time. Um, it was a very interesting time in the in the whole Hollywood, uh, you know, the whole history of Hollywood, and a lot of you know a lot of important things happened a lot of people who were immensely talented uh were couldn't get work at all a lot of people's careers and livelihoods were destroyed because of it and high noon is kind of showing about is showing how is showing all of that um it's very interesting that um uh one of the people who uh was one of the was at the forefront of uh, attacking others within the Hollywood community was John Wayne, and John Wayne hated this movie. <laughs> Coincidentally, John Wayne loathed this movie. He hated this movie so much that they made, that he and Howard Hawks remade this movie uh, in the same in 1959 called Rio Bravo, and how and basically how Rio Bravo is kind of the the opposite of this movie where the where you know it, it, the the guy was able to stand on his own without asking for help. Do you know what I mean? Like, 
it, that's that's another thing about this movie. This movie challenges the idea of of you know masculinity within the West. How no matter what, you know, the good guys uh, wouldn't ask for help because they're so good at what they do. It's the John. It's the, every character John Wayne pretty much ever played in the West. You know what I mean? Um, coincidentally. Gary Cooper wasn't at the Academy Awards to receive his Oscar, and you know who accepted his Oscar on his behalf was John Wayne. Oh my! <laughs> it's, it's a very weird, trivial stuff that comes up. Wow. Um, but if you're very, if you're interested in this, um, there's there's a lot of stuff people can read about it. Uh, the guy who wrote the screenplay, Carl Foreman, was one of the people who was blacklisted by Hollywood when this movie came out. He was already, you know, kicked out of Hollywood, and he was already in in, I think, England or Europe somewhere, uh, you know, trying to get work. Um, it, it, uh, it's very interesting. It's an interesting political tone in this movie because this movie's uh, produced by Stanley Kramer, who, if you're familiar with the films that Stanley Kramer did, they are very political. He did movies like Inherit the Wind. He did films like um, um, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, films that were really political at the time. This movie does have political undertones within it, which I think is why it gets remembered, uh, not only because it's a good movie, but because of the political undertones in it and how it's such a part of its time. But there's also things you can extrapolate into modern times as well. This is a really good movie. Yet again, it's not a traditional Western. There aren't people riding on horsebacks. So there aren't a lot of gunfights in it. It's not a typical John Wayne Western, but it's a very good Western. Well, when, when, and, and, you know, there you go. You hit the nail on the head. It's a very good Western. But when you look at the cast, you don't get all these great actors signing up for crappy movies. You get great actors signing up for great movies. And this cast, you know, unbelievable. I mean, the, the, the supporting cast of Lon Chaney and um, – with I'm going to talk about – I want to talk about um, – somebody really quick before uh, we wrap it up here. Um, Kate, Katie Gerardo. All right. So this is a woman who is an abs, abs Mexican woman. They are not in any movies in Hollywood at this time. They are always portrayed in uh, by white actors and actresses or in blackface so for her to be able to be in a movie in 1952 and have some of the lines of dialogue that she has, powerful lines of dialogue, bossing Lloyd Bridges, <laughs> bossing Lloyd Bridges, uh, and, um, uh, and, uh, and then holding her own against Gary Cooper and Grace Kelly, that tells you how powerful of an actress she was and they wanted somebody that could hold their own in that role. And and, and that really resonated with me in, as far as the film goes, because you don't see that back then. There are as in some to um Paul Bush or they were uh, just a real general one that really just take you to tribute them. Where it only played up like a tour. She sung Phil Carroll, who and he shall demand her. Um, and hope you'll learn in the is he hoping that the props want to sound fake on the face because she him uh told him to ask him to rush leaving. I should not leave the fellow. Uh, I, and, and he, you know, thank you, thank you for all the man, you know, the, the hell of uh, it. I was that, guess, guess, there's a secret, because I just let him, um, he's super, but, you know, I've, you know, so when I said that, I was like, stop, said, buddy, Thing that buddy has sort of cheesy way a shunkive figure. Yeah. So that's you know that's you you know we really shed some light on on this film that was we you know the book the book 
has 52 movies and they're all phenomenal movies. But when we did this and we were able to nominate a bunch of them, I nominated High Noon. I felt that this is a film that deserves to be talked about in this a series. And so when we did season two, I decided, well, I want, I want High Noon. I want to discuss this film. And I'm glad I got you to help me, Andrew, because you really shed a lot of light on, you know, on this film and, and brought a lot uh, to this conversation. So uh, I just really want to say thank you for uh, deciding to do this with me. For all the Matt's movies, glad that on season of Pinocchio's a matter. All right, so um, Andrew, where can you be found? Um, me on my shoes as my turn. Uh, I close it. All right, you can find me at Dance Get Bound on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest, or at From the Fourth Row at uh, WordPress.com or CinesportsTalk.com. That's C I N E S P O R T S T A lk.com where i talk i do uh write reviews about sports and movies so brand you and myself good night